Welcome Wargamers to the lifeless fields of Shyish because today we are talking about the Mortarks. An introduction to them, we're going to list out all the different ones that there are. Really at this point we're trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be a Mortark of Nagash in the Age of Sigmar setting right now? And this, this definition of this role, rather, has expanded quite a bit because when Age of Sigmar first started, we only had three. We had Manfred Neferrata and Arcan the Black. But we've actually gained a few since then and learned about a fourth that never quite took off uh, when it came to the old world. We'll get to that in a little bit. But so today we're going to go through the different Mortarks, what they do for Nagash on a one-to-one -one level have a discussion on what they do, how they lead armies, that kind of thing, and then round it out with a discussion on, on why is it cool, right? Why is it cool that an army has a Mortark to it? Now, one thing I'd like to add real quick before we begin, if you're interested in any of the Death Factions or any hobby supplies for an upcoming project, please consider using my affiliate link down below for Not Just Gaming, an awesome store over on the East Coast of the U.S., with tons of discounts on Games Workshop products, as well as tons of hobby supplies. So if you have a project coming up or you're looking to expand an army, anytime you use that link, big or small, it goes directly to supporting me, and I could not be more grateful. It all goes to supporting me, my wife, our cats, this whole thing, and I'm just so overjoyed. Now, usually at this point I say, like, for those of you who are new to the faction, but we're talking about a whole bunch of factions, right? If you're new to the Grand Alliance that is death, welcome. We have a broad conversation because what constitutes a death faction in AOS varies wildly. Because on one hand, you have something like the Night Haunt, these, these geists that are mad with all kinds of terror. They hate the living. They're very hard to corral and kind of use in a military sense. On the flip side, you have the Flesh Eater Courts, which are largely made up of actual living people being led by vampires, but they're living people who think that they're doing these nice complicated wheels and pivots and you know, military formations, and they're just a gaggle of just insane people. And somewhere in the middle, you've got like vampire lineages of people who are actually good at fighting and have, you know, a right mind, if you will. You've got full-blown constructs of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers who don't really rationalize like anybody else does. And at the top of all of that, you have one central figure, Nagash himself. But that's a pretty darn big spectrum, right? You've got liches, vampires, skeletons, undead animals, vargulfs. There's a lot of directions that death goes in Age of Sigmar. But today we're going to limit the discussion to the factions that specifically have Mortarks and just kind of focus on those characters. So, the Mortarks that we know at this point in Age of Sigmar lore, we have Manfred von Karstein. Mortark of the Night. We have Neferata, the Mortark of Blood. Arcan, the Mortark of the Sacrament. Catacros, the Mortark of the Necropolis. And Lady Olander, the Mortark of Grief. I'm going to throw an honorable mention out there to Ushorin. Ushorin is an old world character that actually was brought forward into the Age of Sigmar setting but went mad and is sort of like the progenitor of what we know as the Flesh Eater Courts, but it's not quite a Mortark currently in the setting in the same way that others are, but was brought forward to be one. So we'll just say Ushoran has an asterisk, you know, that says future plot point possibly with a question mark, and we'll just kind of put him off to the side for this discussion. Now of the ones that we mentioned, three of those right off the bat, or I should say four, are from the Old World. Manfred, Neferata, Arcan, they all played pivotal parts in the collapse of the world that was. Arcan started off the entire, you know, campaign sequence by bringing Nagash back. Neferata aided him, became basically a servant when he went south and started attacking the Tomb King Empire. Manfred, the whole time, was trying to backstab and find ways to power, but he kept helping because it kept furthering his agenda. The idea was he's going to let Nagash ruin everything and then he'll usurp Nagash and just be in control. Because that's what Manfred does. Now, one of the hounding questions that I got the first several years of Age of Sigmar being around, right? The old world blew up. So how are these characters here? What brought them to the Age of Sigmar setting? Well, it starts with Nagash. We know that the mortal heroes in the world that was that bound themselves to a wind of magic, they all seem to have generally speaking, uh, made it through into Age of Sigmar. Nagash being one of those with the wind of magic of Shayish, death. Okay, so Nagash gets brought over to the current setting. Sigmar frees him because at this point, the way that Shayish naturally works, there's a bunch of death gods and he 
knows, well, at least I know Nagash, right? The enemy I know is better than the, the enemy I don't. So he unleashes Nagash and basically charges him with get Shyish under control. So he did. And so Nagash began to basically consume death deities from all different religions and factions. And as he was doing so, the sheer scale of the mortal realms became very clear to him. So the idea of, of spreading his influence and will became a real issue. He needs to have trusted people, you know, who trusted in quotes. He doesn't trust them. He just wants people to do what he says at the right places at the right time. And as he's doing this traveling and, and kind of corralling the realm of Shaiish to his own will, some things kind of come to mind. In fact, little wisps across the, the realm of Shaiish seem very familiar. These are kind of like the shards of soul that are remnants from the original characters. Neferata, Arkan, Manfred, all of those. He's finding bits and pieces of them. And so in this age of myth, he began to start putting his servants back together. And so this big question of how did Nagash bring these Mortarks to, you know, the Age of Sigmar uh, setting? Well, what we know as Manfred, Neferata, and Arkan are actually creations of Nagash. The, the raw soul stuff of those characters was used, but Nagash, as we learned in Soul Wars, is a bit of a tinkerer. So while these are reconstituted versions of those original characters, he did make some modifications. There are things that we know Nagash can do to these characters that are above and beyond. So for example, he altered them to be able to always see and communicate if needed to his Mortarks. There's scenes in the early Age of Sigmar where like Neferata's head will like lurch back and her eyes will roll up in her skull and Nagash begins speaking through her. They're all puppets but he rebuilt them with their personalities because they have traits and qualities that he needs. They're, they're very useful in a military sense, but he also built in a lot of like mental back doors, so to speak, so he always had control. Now, specifically, Manfred and Neferata were brought back for the sole purpose of creating uh, vampiric dynasties. Nagash wanted to reintroduce, you know, these death-wielding monsters into the realms, and so he brought back two vampires to go spread vampirism. And what's great is that Neferata and Manfred, they're wildly different for being the Adam and Eve, so to speak, of this particular species. Because they've both formed and run their respective dynasties, if you will. Manfred with the von Karsteins and played the political game there. Neferata over in the old world was part of the Tomb Kings and was part of that sort of a very different type of, of political power structure. So they're different, but they're also highly effective at what they do. And the idea is we'll, we'll get them in early and then over the millennia, given, you know, Nagash can just rebuild them if these Mortarks die, he's gonna, they're going to supplant an entire population of vampires, which will itself propagate more vampires. So that's an easy one, okay? And I can control the death magic and stuff. What about Arcan? Well, he was essentially, in some ways, kind of like Nagash's court wizard, even though Nagash is the wizard. This is his servant. Nagash is the idea guy, and Arkan is the one who implements said ideas. When Nagash was like, we should build a giant pyramid out of death magic, Arkan was like, I will organize the line. Let's do it. And he does the, the kind of middle management stuff. He's exceptionally powerful in his own right. Uh, the more we go through the AOS lore, it seems like he's slowly kind of growing more of a personality and a conscience. Whereas to Nagash, he presents himself as being completely devoid of self. He's like, I am a servant. I live to serve. You deserve everything. And then sometimes in the background, we get these little hints that like Arcan has his own thing going on. And I'm, I'm happy about that. But yes, he is, a, is more of a lich than a vampire and was brought specifically to serve Nagash in a direct way. Whereas Neferata and Manfred are more of an indirect kind of thing. Now for the remaining two characters... We got to see their story unfold right in front of us. Lady Olander, I call her Lady O sometimes, uh, and Catacros represent Nagash's ability to seize opportunities and so millennia-long plan, respectively. So we'll go through those. Lady Olander was chosen to lead the Night Haunt. This came out in the Soul Wars session. It's basically uh, Age of Sigmar version 2. When that second edition came out, they had the Soul Wars set of Stormcast versus Night Haunt. And this is where the Night Haunt faction was introduced to us, both as, you know, in the game terms, but also as products that you and I can buy. And this was a result of 
the Necroquake, a giant spell that Nagash did. He was going to raise the dead everywhere, and it only kind of half worked. He got a whole bunch of geists and, and ghosts, but he wasn't really like in control of them in the way he wanted. And so he basically promotes a character named Lady Olander, who had served in Shayish and basically was just in a state of perpetual grief and torment because of the life she lived and Nagash was giving her a due punishment. So he's like, actually, I see potential. She has gusto, right? So she's going to take Lady Olander, promotes her in charge. As the, you're now the head of the Night Haunt, more Tark of Grief. And Lady Olander gets the role of kind of corralling all of these wandering ghosts and geists and, and the monsters into an actual military force. She calls them processions rather than military, you know, name nomenclature, like armies, divisions, that kind of thing. And she's really the first to seize the opportunity that the Night Haunt present in a military sense. Because uh, wandering bands of ghosts are, are a danger at any given point in the setting. But when they're concentrated and you have a military mind that's using their ability to go ethereal between walls and stuff like that as a weapon, and it's very focused... Now they become a different kind of danger. And she's not subtle. I'm not saying that, she, you know, she's not going to win the Battle of Kini or anything like that with her mental genius. It's more that she's about corralling and, and picking a direction and pointing all of the ghosts in the area in that direction. Because when you read the Night Haunt stories, specifically in the book Soul Wars, there's a, a big clash at the end where the Night Haunt invade a city. It, it's madness. They roll over things like they're a tidal wave more so than a charging army. She is the director of this tidal wave. The next one here is Catacros, uh, Mortark of the Necropolis. And instead of being uh, basically promoted based on opportunity, meaning the Night Haunt came and Nagash was like, I need some middle management and promoted Lady Olander, Catacros's army of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers was a plan that was laid early in the timeline. Like in the Age of Myth, when all these initial th discoveries and, and recreations of people are happening, Nagash begins the Ossiarch Bone Reaper project, meant to be a, a weapon of attrition that would last forever, but eventually see the realms far and wide succumb to the powers of death. They mold raw bone uh, into crafting things, like they can actually custom create every single warrior part of their body, and they make it into weapons and living artillery and cavalry and all these kinds of things. Catacros is the military mastermind. He is, you know, the Hannibal uh, general and, and leader of our time. As opposed to Lady Olander, who's more of just like a pick a direction and everybody goes that way. Catacros has some like next level thoughts. Like he's over here playing Total War on hard mode. In fact, he got the job because Nagash had an invading army in Shayish at some point. Catacros had already died, and in the afterlife, he mounted this stunning defense and repelled Nagash's armies for like several months until Nagash was like, you got Moxie, you want a job? And basically, he flipped sides. It was pretty amazing. So that's how we got our Mortarks, but what do they actually do? Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, the Mortarks essentially lead these armies that are large enough to swallow continents. And their sole mission is to spread death magic or its influence, whether it's control uh, or sapping all the life from an area, whatever it is, essentially replicate their army wherever it looks. If it's Nighthawn invading, they want to kill a bunch of people, raise a bunch of ghosts, and have a bigger ghost army for the next town. If it's Ossiarch Bone Reapers, they want to harvest all the bone material, again, reinforce themselves and go... The forces of the Soul Blight could have any numerous reasons for attacking a place, but generally speaking, if you have one of the Mortarks there, it's because that place needs to be wiped off the map. The Mortarks themselves will often move between armies because it's not like they were hired to lead X army. Like even the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, as a faction, yeah, Catacros was meant to lead them, but he's not like necessarily tied to a singular place. Whatever front needs a military mastermind, their Catacros will be, for example. But the scale of the armies that they move between is truly massive. For example, um, two Mortarks went and invaded the Eight Points, and that's the whole Wrath of the Ever Chosen campaign book, which is still, in my opinion, the best single campaign supplement that Games Workshop's made. But it essentially goes through the entire like venture of Catacros invading 
the eight points setting up his own little place there, his own little Osiric Bone Reaper factory, if you will, and is constantly launching massive military campaigns against Archeon in his home base. These things are huge. The size of these armies is what I'm getting at. And they serve their purpose for Nagash just simply by being so different. I mean, Nagash is such a stagnant character by design. I mean, he's death in in incarnate he is just a stagnant force of nature or so he likes to think of himself so having different generals with different eccentricities and strengths and weaknesses and personalities and ability to see different types of situations or find creative solutions that's what he needs and it's exactly what all of these characters bring i think from nagash's perspective he kind of sees it as himself in a boxing ring in the different realms and the various types of Mortarks he has allows him to you know, s offer different kinds of swings at his opponent. If I need a suffocating blast, I'm going to send Lady Olander and just flood the area with Night on. If I need a precision strike that requires like stealth and stuff like that, I run to send Neferata because she's able to infiltrate areas with her vampires and set up whole spy networks and stuff like that. Like there's just the right tool for the right job, which is exactly how Nagash sees all of them. They're just tools to be used for his purpose. The only real universal thing you can say about the Mortarks is that they, generally speaking, don't like each other at all. Lady O and Catacros get along well enough. I mean, we saw them fight together in Wrath of the Everchosen. There was never really much dialogue between the two of them, which I thought was a wasted opportunity. But we do have multiple scenes of Neferata and Manfred just actively <laughs> reaming each other out. They hate each other. Whenever one of them is away at war, the other will go attack their lands that they were given by Nagash. And it's just this very stupid rivalry between vampires. But generally speaking, none of these guys get along well. When Nagash was searching for his uh, his Mortarks, you know, being a team player wasn't really high on the desired skills list. It was more just like, can you get the job done and can you do it in a unique way? Awesome. And so let's round down this discussion talking about why is this cool, right? It's, it's so strange to think you, every faction in death has Nagash, the true suffocating god of undeath. But why would you want these kind of middle managers? Well... To me, it's a reflection of Nagash, right? Nagash is all, all is Nagash. No matter what kind of afterlife you have in store, there is a personally trained and empowered Nagash representative to help you get into the fight. These are essentially his lieutenants, but one that represents every kind of way that death can manifest as a weapon. It's a little unclear how often Nagash communicates with them, but I can't imagine it's terribly often. These guys just go out and execute entire campaigns on their own without direct communication. So, like, there's a lot of, again, I don't want to use the word trust because I don't think Nagash trusts them, but there's a lot of slack on their leash, so to speak, compared to other death faction, you know, heroes. Because that autonomy is what makes them useful tools. They can problem solve. They can come up with creative solutions or try new things respond in real time. Things that, you know, for example, white kings and stuff like that tend to not be as good at doing. Just because they have less, I don't know, mental power. But that independence and that ability to think creatively comes at a cost. And that is, all of the Mortarks hate being under Nagash's thumb, right? Probably the one who likes him the most is either Arcan the Black or Catacros. But that's mainly because Nagash lets them do what they already wanted to do. Whereas like Neferata, Lady Olander, Manfred, they hate being under Nagash's thumb. Ushorin, again, is another one who uh, we think is the vampire that was driven insane to become the, the progenitor of the Flesh Eater Courts. He does not like Nagash one bit. And so they're all trying to get out from under his control, but they simply don't have a way to do that yet. I know that I would love a, a story arc. Whether it's a full campaign for everybody or just something like that that shows Nagash's power kind of being dismantled after the epic things that was, you know, the Necroquake. I would love, like, like what if the Mortark stayed the same, but his constant control kind of diminished over them? So he, it's not as direct. So all of a sudden, what we know is Mortarks become very minor death gods. And maybe they can mantle some of the ones that once roamed Shyish. That would be rad as heck if all of a sudden, like, Manfred could peel off a portion of his realm and just make, you know, the knight. Or empire of knight, whatever he wants to call it. And, I mean, they already have their own little, like, societies and stuff like that. But I'm talking about, like, having them represent 
minor factions within death rather than a middle servant to Nagash. As for which of these Mortarks is objectively the best, in my opinion, uh, I gotta go Neferata. She's the best. Her books are the most fun to read. Uh, specifically because she does a lot of great character building. When you talk about Neferata, a lot of the focus is around the, the spy networks and the, the warrior leaders that she surrounds herself with to instigate her war. She's a very communal leader. Like she has a lot of input on a lot of things and kind of weighs and measures them. And it makes for compelling dialogue. Whereas most of the stuff with Manfred is just, I'm going to go do this. And he goes and does it. Whereas Neferata, I just, I find that there's a larger plan at place and it makes it much more interesting to read. As for the others, they don't typically have a ton of reading material. Uh, obviously, with Neferata, Manfred, and Arcan, you can go to the old world and read a bunch of their stuff. They have come out with short stories for Lady Olander and Catacros. Haven't gotten to them yet, but there are great stories out there. But I would love to hear your thoughts. Which of the Mortarks is your favorite? Why is that so? And which of them would you like to have more, we'll call it screen time for the sake of this, but basically what would you like to focus on more? For me, I want more books like we had with uh, Wrath of the Ever Chosen. I loved seeing Catacros and Lady O, even though their relationship to one another wasn't really touched on really at all. I want to see them working together in tandem more because they're truly terrifying if they can combine their strengths instead of being divided by their weaknesses. But let me know what you think. I would love to hear your comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I can't wait to hang out with you next time. Happy Wargaming.